Hi everyone, Kelvin here from London. Going to review today, take a look at this from the 70s, from the vintage period. Optonica, Optonica, not sure how you would say that. Um, it throws up some interesting things if you're a vintage stereo person. And it's also reminded me, it's given me some flashbacks, to be honest with you, uh, about listening to certain vintage amps back in the day. Okay, we'll do the technical stuff and then I'll like go into detail about the sound. So this is Optonica SA3131, uh, 1977 I have, uh, 50 watts per channel. It's got a big uh, transformer. It's a heavy, you know, it's a heavy bit of kit. Um, interesting thing, Optonica, was actually the, uh, some people call it the skunk works. <laughs> what it was, was a, a, a company, um, umbrella company for this is Sharp. Yeah. <clears throat> you might, uh, you might remember Sharp from the olden days. They really weren't highly rated Sharp. Yeah. And I think they made this to sort of, you know, get themselves into the hi-fi market. And maybe this is my guess, sort of, you know, they couldn't do it with the name Sharp. This is what I'm thinking anyway. But anyway, uh, you know, substantial bit of kit, uh, two sets of speakers, usual stuff, bass mid, treble, nothing, nothing special, nothing uh, lacking, you know. Uh, actually, uh, two phonos, got two phono inputs there, an aux and a tuner, so no problem with inputs. What is interesting and kind of why I want to do this thing about this is because it, it helps bring into perspective a lot of sounds, what things sounded like in that vintage period, you know? So uh, let me say, let's talk about the sound of this machine. I put this on and somehow I was drawn. I was, I was, I'll tell you what happened. I put this on. And I was actually getting sort of weird, like like audio flashbacks from going into hi-fi shops in the 70s and 80s and listening to things that weren't that good. And there and this was was pressing those buttons for me, to be quite frank. And the, the area where you really notice what's going on or you could say wrong with this is the base. Yeah, it's the base. Now, what I did to sort of get this cleared up in my head, I started playing a lot of Pink Floyd. One, Pink Floyd's nice for separation and kind of well-recorded stuff. And, you know, it's very familiar, but also there's a lot of uh, interesting changes uh, bass wise in Pink Floyd, you know, it's sort of, uh, I don't know, it's almost like sometimes I feel like it's lead bass and everything go, you know, they build up in these verses to these choruses and there's a sort of like big structural changes in the music and it's kind of bassy. And I listened to a whole bunch of Pink Floyd stuff on this. And I've got to tell you, this was messing up. It was just messing up the bass and it was not allowing me to follow the music and enjoy it. And I swapped over from this to other vintage stuff, the Sony, Sansui. Immediately, I, I start getting, um, I can kind of get into it and I can follow the bass. Now, let me try and clarify this. Let me try and clarify this. What goes on here, it's like there are humps at certain frequencies. This is the best way I could describe it. It's like someone's, it's like you're seeing a band and someone is going up to the bass guitar amplifier and just kind of randomly boosting the sound, 
we're you know boosting the bass boosting the volume lowering the volume it's just messing it up just it's just messing up and as i said before i started to re when i was listening to it i go oh yeah i remember this unhappy bass sound that i remember hearing basically on cheaper amplifiers yeah so it you know it just doesn't do it good he can't follow the bass it messes up the dynamics it messes up the flow and i listen to all those pink floyd records i listen to about 15 20 tracks on pink floyd and after a while i, I just realized i i am not enjoying this at all <laughs> it's just, it, i'm not enjoying it at all uh on the plus side uh separation was fine mid range was a little bit iffy i mean it's not rubbish you know it's not rubbish it would take a little bit of time before you realized the shortcomings of this if you just plugged it in but to me uh, i don't want to beat around the bush i just think it does not do certain things properly correctly it's not a matter of opinion you know it's like do you want an out of focus photograph? Do you want a TV where half the screen is a bit blurry? You know, like nobody wants that, you know, nobody wants that. So truth of the matter is that this opt Optonica made by Sharp, it doesn't cut the mustard, it doesn't hit the mark. I mean, if you look inside here, which I have, you know, it's full of uh, the same kind of components. It's got a big uh, transformer. Maybe that's the, the faulted area, if you'd ask me. But uh, what I'm getting at here is, it seems to me the things that make amplifiers good, or receivers, you know, but the amplifiers in them, good and work. It may not be just about costs of uh, parts. It's just the effort or, you know, the, the, what the engineer knows or how long they're spending on it. This is what I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, even though I would say Sansui, which I do love, I, I think they have great transformers. I'm presuming that is what, where they're a big plus is there. But I also think there's a lot of things that never quite make the grade. And I'm just thinking, is it just, they didn't, they didn't try hard enough. And that happens with uh, speakers for sure, where they don't, they just don't work on it for long enough and tweak it around and listen. And uh, anyway, anyway, the point, uh, the, what I'm really doing here is saying, this is a vintage receiver. It looks quite good. It doesn't sound very good. Ultimately, I'm not getting great. I'm not getting much enjoyment at all out of this. This is one of these ones that didn't hit the mark, of which there are, you know, a whole bunch. You know, the reason you haven't heard particularly of Optonica is because it didn't hit the mark. It didn't gain a reputation. The prices didn't, people didn't talk about it. You know, people didn't say, oh, that's the one to get, like they do say about early Sansui amps. And those sent the prices high. People, I should talk about price because it's probably kind of hard to tell. I think there are some prices I've seen where I'd say people are just sort of trying their luck going, look, it's a silver fronted vintage receiver from the 70s. Let's try and get 250 pounds for it because someone might think it's a vintage receiver. It must be good. It doesn't do it. It does not do it. Um, so, you know, OK, I won't I won't spend a long time on telling you this isn't very good, but I wanted to bring something on and talk about it. Uh, now maybe I'll just give a tiny bit more about the sound. Mid range was a bit iffy. You had the, the tiny, you might just about be able to use the word tinny, which is a terrible word to use. And it's not I mean, it's small, but the mid range got a bit tinny and say the symbols didn't have the depth 
particularly on all that nice Pink Floyd, beautifully sounded. When the cymbals go off on those Pink Floyd songs, you normally get, you know, a real decay into a space, you know, which I immediately got better when I switched to uh, other Japanese amps. But uh, so there you have it. It doesn't, this one does not hit the mark. Sorry, Optonica. Sorry, Sharp. There's a reason why you're not a famous name from the 70s or 80s. Okay, that's about it. Okay, bye for now.